Hello there, my fellow nom nom nomming friends, and welcome back to our lore series on the rather hungry Xenos race known as the Tyranids. In my previous video covering these fellows, I got started on the stages of their planetary assimilation and consumption process. I got through stages 1, 2 and 3, which are reconnaissance, infestation and assault respectively. Those were not all of them however, as there are 5 stages in total, and today we're gonna talk about the last two. We're also gonna talk a little bit more about the Tyranid Combat Doctrine, if you can call it that. I am your host, for today the Xenoform narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? Resuming from the previous episode's topic, we will go to stage 4, which is subjugation. Even as the more militant bioforms continue to battle the defenders of the planet, others begin sweeping up behind them, collecting all available biomass. Some of the substrates collected are used to generate additional Tyranid creatures. In this manner, the planet's natural resources are turned against it, providing additional tools for the swarm. The majority, however, is set aside to feed the high fleet orbiting the planet. Those massive creatures generally delay their feeding until the planet is completely secure. Near the battlefront, untold thousands of maggot-like ripper bioforms are deployed from the sky to form massive, tightly packed swarms. With fang-filled jaws, they devour every organic substance they can find, living or dead. Once these abominations have eaten all that they can, they slowly drag their bloated bodies towards digestive pools formed by the capillary towers. Rather than spewing the devoured biomass into the pool, the rippers hurl themselves inside, to be digested along with all that they devoured. New rippers are continuously created to propagate the cycle of gluttony. As the planet's surface is depleted, similar bioforms deplete all the life in the ocean and within the planet's crust. Rippers move through the ocean in massive swarms as well, devouring all the sea life they encounter. Burrowing variants expand the tunnels dug by the trigons and the raveners, consuming subterranean fungi, root systems, and any burrowing fauna. Mineral reserves are also depleted, particularly rare ores that may be incorporated into the exoskeletons of the various bioforms. Massive capillary towers develop in even the deepest parts of the planet's oceans. These towers, which may stretch several kilometers up through the sea, are capable of withstanding even the crushing pressures of the depths, and thriving even the coldest of waters. As they grow, they may even modify the planet's tidal flow, as their powerful metabolic filtration systems draw in all the biomass. The only effective solution at this stage is exterminatus. Planets which have been subdued are no longer salvageable. The only hope of the Imperium is to destroy the feeding system before the biomass can be used to feed the fleet for further attacks. The one positive aspect in all of this is that at this stage the Tyranid fleet may have expended all their resources in preparation for the gluttony they expect as the planet's biomass is absorbed. Attacking the void bearing bioforms and annihilating the planet may be easier at this stage than at any other portion of the assault. Finally, stage 5 is Absorption. As the last of the system's defenders fall, the capillary towers begin to feed biomass back to the hive ship and its escorts. The massive living vessels extend the tendrils through the atmosphere, which make contact with the capillary towers, as they grow to pierce the edges of the atmosphere. Biomass is drawn up the towers, through a combination of massive pumping organs and suction. Once the last of the defenders have fallen, the surviving creatures of the Tyranid hordes hurl themselves into the digestive pools near the capillary towers. Their bodies are broken down and devoured, so that the biomass may be returned to the fleet and recycled into new creatures for a future conquest. Along with their biomass, their memories, genetic innovation, and new gene patterns of all the planet's life forms are also absorbed. After the last vestiges of life have been absorbed, the capillary towers begin to absorb the planet's water systems. 
All of these liquids are transferred into the void-faring organisms, some of which may grow dramatically in size as their storage compartments expand to accommodate the newfound resources. As this happens, many of the capillary towers are also broken down so that their biomass may also be absorbed. Finally, the planet's atmosphere, and then the last few remaining capillary towers are absorbed into the hive ships. Some magi biologists theorize that this may require even more massive void-faring tyranids than those previously identified. Others postulate that the ships use previously unknown biotechnology to compress the atmosphere into a solid state. Though the precise mechanism is unknown to the Imperium, the outcome is certain and there for all to see. Nothing is left behind but a barren, airless rock of little value. As it travels between systems, the hive mind analyzes new genetic patterns it has identified. Some of these may be used to develop new bioforms for a future conquest. However, these new strains may not appear immediately. The hive mind may save them for deployment at a time when a new strategy is required. Clearly, adaptation is a key factor in the Tyranids' long-term success and survival. By stage 5, the battle is well and truly lost. Any defenders who arrive are far too late to save the planet. Their only possible hope is to spread word to neighboring star systems, in the hope that they might arrive before the Tyranid threat. Attacking the void-faring bioforms immediately after they fed on a world is a very bad idea, as that is to attack them at the height of their power. Before moving in and literally eating a planet, the Tyranids often attempt to first conquer it via subterfuge and infiltration. Space hulks and other derelict spacecraft are infested with gene stealers, which quickly familiarize themselves with the layout of their new home and then enter hibernation. When the hulk is eventually discovered by Imperial authorities, the gene stealers attack the exploration crew, sometimes killing some of the members, but always leaving at least one survivor. This person is implanted with a seed, a form of a gene stealer reproductive virus that contains a specially engineered tyranid DNA. The infestation is never fatal, but instead the virus's genetic material subtly alters the victim's DNA, producing in them a strong urge to mate, created by the stimulation of the individual's sex hormones. The gene stealer DNA will be incorporated into the host germ cells, so that any child that results from the union will be a gene stealer hybrid, which now has the complete loyalty of its parents via the psychic bond. The hybrids continue to breed and multiply among the population of the host race, eventually forming a so-called gene stealer cult. As this cult grows in number, it begins to spread its influence throughout the planet's political and social structure, placing members in positions of power, including the government and the military. At the same time, the cult's hybrid members begin to emit a collective psychic signal through the warp, which acts as a beacon to the approaching Tyranid Hive Fleet. As the Hive Fleet nears the doomed world, the Gene Stealer cult, potentially numbering in the millions at this point, goes into action, instigating a worldwide rebellion with the goal of weakening the planet's defenders. The Hive Fleet will also seed the planet with Tyranid organisms, which will begin to biologically alter the planet's climate, surface, and ecosystems to make it easier to consume. On the battlefield, Tyranid tactics are based around the notion of sheer numbers, as they generally try to outnumber the enemy by dozens to one. They overrun a position in close combat, closing faster than many other types of armies. They possess some ranged weapons too, but their sheer numbers and close combat specialization usually makes up for the slaughter they have to endure in order to get to melee range. Tyranid warrior organisms are creatures of visceral horror, implacable monsters with razor-sharp claws which can tear a man apart in the blink of an eye, and grotesque biocannons which fire hungry parasitic projectiles into their prey's flesh. Every weapon and projectile used by the high fleets is an actual living organism by itself, grown from the reconstituted biomatter of a previous invasion. The Tyranids have no kind of mechanical technology, 
and instead harness an advanced form of biotechnology to create organic equivalents of the tools, weapons, and ammunition used by the other races. These creatures live in a highly symbiotic fashion, fusing into each other's flesh so it is often impossible to say where one Tyranid ends and another begins. In this way, the Tyranid warrior beasts wield living weapons that are literally extensions of their own body, each one a killing machine, perfectly adapted to slaughter the foe. The bioconstruct nature of the Tyranids in general makes them a terrible foe to face, for their armies contain a specialized creature for every conceivable facet of warfare, which can be altered and regrown to suit a battle's needs in a short span of time. Thus, a high fleet can adapt to generate a force capable of overwhelming any opposition, unleashing an army of monsters which can fly, run, burrow, and stalk through the defenses of any foe. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Tyranids and their stages of planet absorption for today. In case you're curious, it is very likely I will move on to covering individual Tyranid units next, alongside with at least one video, I hope, about Tyranid ranged and melee weapons, as symbiotic as they are. Are you a fan of the Tyranids? What do you think about the stages of planetary consumption? Would you stay and fight for your world, or would you submit it to Exterminatus if you could? Feel free to share any thoughts and opinions in the comments below. Was the episode informative or entertaining? In that case, please click the like button and subscribe for future content. Thank you very much for watching to the end, and I wish you all an awesome day. The Emperor Protects.